Hiram laid awake on the cabin's floor, curled up in an old quilt, and listened to the field mice who scampered around under the floorboards. Outside, a light misty rain fell as bullfrogs sang out from their hiding places. The dawn was finally breaking, and Hiram knew that old man Tatum would fire him if he didn't get up and go open that gas station before the locals were out and about. But still, he laid there, watching the sky slowly come to life as the shadows revealed themselves to be Georgia pines towering towards the heavens. Hiram finally arose, wringing the water from his wet socks that had been air drying during the night before, and he dusted off his pants. He reached to his side and took the last drink that remained in the cheap bottle of wild turkey whiskey, and then he tossed it aside. His eyes scanned the empty room. There was no furniture and only a few worthless, discarded items scattered about. The fireplace in the corner was cold, just as it had been for weeks. And just then, there was that pain again in his stomach, a reminder that he hadn't ate the day before. His mind drifted back to the cotton fields of Mississippi, those muddy rivers and sunsets that seemed to burn for hours during the hot summer months. It was all as clear as a painting in his mind. He finally made it to his feet and he walked outside. The ground was slick with mud and he saw something shining in it that had been washed clean by the rain. A dime. Hmm. This day was already off to a good start, he thought as he slid it into his pocket. The sun was just now beginning to peek through the trees and onto the porch of his shack, whose front door was sagging so heavily that it had cut a path into the wooden floor. It was time to get a move on, so he set out down the long red clay driveway that was so muddy he had to leave his truck parked on the main gravel road about an eighth of a mile away just to keep from getting stuck. His boots sunk into the muck with each step, and when he reached the road, the interior of the truck was soaking wet since the back glass was busted out. The keys were still in the ignition, and he turned the engine over. Hmm, but no luck. Only a few pops and clicks. The battery cable must be loose, he thought, as he opened the hood on the old International, the rat's nest of patchwork wiring that scattered across the engine bay signaled that its best days were behind it. And after a few more attempts, it was clear that old Betsy wasn't in the mood today, and Hiram grabbed a small toolbox from the bed of the truck and set it down beside him as he sat on the tailgate waiting for some kind soul to come along and stop and offer him a ride. And Hiram had seen old man Tatum fire several men for showing up late or skipping work altogether. Ain't nary a thing worse than a man who's a fear of an honest day's work. The old man had little patience for freeloaders and half-assers. Hiram pulled a half-smoked cigarette butt from his jacket and took a few puffs as the forest around him slowly came to life. The rain had stopped as a doe and her fawn stepped out of the woods cautiously, flicking her tail as she stared at Hiram before crossing the road and leaping across a ditch and then disappearing into the woods again. The immediate area surrounding the truck was lined in tall, overgrown wildflowers. And for a moment, Hiram seemed to focus on them, daydreaming, until the sound of crunching gravel could be heard in the distance as an old Ford truck came into view. An elderly man rolled down his window and took a plug of tobacco from his cheek and tossed it out. You need a ride? The old man asked. Oh, yes, sir, I do. Hiram answered as he set his toolbox in the bed of the truck and climbed into the passenger side. The old man reached on the steering column and pulled the transmission lever into drive. Is that your international there? Boy, they don't make them like that anymore. Well, someday she's mine, but she's bad honoring, and today is one of those days. 
The tired international truck disappeared in the distance as the pair drove on. Where are you off to this morning? The old man asked. Well, just outside of Dalton, Hiram replied. The Phillips service station. Oh, you work for Mr. Tatum, do you? Well, I've known him since we were both wet behind the ear. He ain't changed in area a bit. Still just as hard-headed as ever. Hiram looked over at the old man and noticed he had a pint of whiskey between his legs. You mind if I get a pull of that? Don't mind at all. It helps a fella get moving in the morning by lighting a fire in his belly. He handed Hiram the half-full bottle. Here, you can keep it. I got two more under the seat. Hiram took a hard pull and then slipped the bottle into his jacket. You married, stranger? The old man asked. But Hiram just shook his head no as he gazed out the foggy window at the passing trees. Well, good for you, boy. I tell you, I've been married for 42 years, and I ain't had nary a single day of peace since the wedding. Hiram didn't respond. Instead, he took another drink. The gravel road soon turned to rough black top as the truck picked up a bit of speed and the forest began to clear with the occasional house with yards that were littered with junk cars and storm shelters. And just then the truck passed through a clearing and the bright morning sun shined on Hiram's face. He closed his eyes and once again he thought of Mississippi. He could feel the heat on his skin. That burning humidity in the air and the smell of that delta, fertile soil. Now, it's true that the delta was his home, but it was also the place of his greatest heartbreaks. You see, Hiram was born in Greenwood in a run-down shack that locals called a shotgun house. Now, Greenwood was once the cotton capital of the world and had made the rich landowners filthy rich, while the poor blacks and whites that worked in those farms wallowed in poverty. And he had never known his father, who disappeared before he was even born, and his mother had passed away when he was just a boy. With no relatives to take him in, Hiram and his older sister, Rose, bounced around in foster homes for a couple of years, never staying in a home more than a couple of months. Yet, the brother and sister did the best they could to take care of each other. And truth is, they were the only ones who truly understood one another. They would frequently walk together, picking wildflowers, and Rose would always make necklaces out of them always putting one around her brother's neck, pretending that they were rich and lived in a faraway land in a beautiful house. She would always say, Life is like a field of wildflowers. No matter what life throws at them, they thrive in the sun and bend gracefully in the wind. Despite their love for one another, it seemed the foster parents were more interested in collecting the check from the state for taking the kids in than they were for caring for them, and most families wouldn't take in two kids. So, before long, he was separated from Rose, and he never saw her again. Just like that, Hiram had no family and nowhere to feel that he belonged. The Christmas after his mother died, Hiram had been living with a preacher and his family for a few weeks and Hiram watched as all the family opened gifts. The preacher had bought his son a shiny bike, and it was the first brand new bike that Hiram had ever seen. A couple days later, Hiram took the bike out for a ride, and when he returned, the man of God was standing on the front porch waiting for him with an extension cord in his hand. Spare the rod and spoil the child, he said as he delivered a brutal whipping that surely only the most despicable of humans were capable of. Well, Hiram ran away that night, the best he could anyway. He had whelps all over his back and his legs for weeks. At 11 years old, he was now on his own and found himself picking cotton for $6 a week, bouncing around from plantation to plantation. You know, life has a sense of humor like that. While most people had fond memories of childhood, Hiram had barely survived it, and by the time he was 18, he had lived a life of abuse and poverty that could fill an encyclopedia on the subject. And then there was that one summer with Clara. She, too, 
had survived an abusive childhood, and her jet black eyes hinted at the pain that she somehow had buried deep inside and would never speak of again. Clara was a light in Hiram's otherwise dark world, but alas, their relationship was just as explosive as those violent summer thunderstorms that rolled across those cotton fields, packed with terrifying lightning, blinding rain, and powerful winds that frequently destroyed any and everything in its path. It proved impossible to sustain, and it certainly didn't help that Hiram had never experienced stability in his life. And before long, he left their stormy relationship behind and bounced around from place to place, picking up odd jobs and never staying for more than a couple weeks. He had been in the lumber camps down in Gadsden, Alabama, and those construction crews up in Crossfield, Tennessee. Another day, another town, another boss. It was all just like a blur. And now, here he was in Dalton, Georgia, working at a gas station, changing oil and fixing flats for old man Tatum. Yet, despite the years and the miles between him and the Mississippi Delta, Hiram still felt the pull of that muddy river. There would always be the pain and the lessons of his past and how it had shaped the man that he had become. Just then, the old Ford truck began to slow down and Hiram was pulled back to the present and he opened his eyes. There was the gas station ahead. He reached for the bottle one last time and finished it down. Thanks for the ride, he said as the truck pulled into the parking lot. The old Ford truck rattled to a stop in front of the service station. The sun was fully up, casting long shadows across the cracked asphalt. And the station, while well, it looked as worn as Hiram felt, with peeling paint and a sagging roof and an old rusted, creaking Phillips 66 metal sign swaying gently in the morning breeze. As Hiram walked towards his normal spot in the service bay, he spotted old man Tatum standing outside his office with his arms crossed and his face set in a deep scowl. The old man's eyes narrowed as he watched Hiram approach. And Hiram, well, he braced himself. You're late, Hiram, Tatum barked, his voice rough like gravel. And it ain't the first time, neither. I don't keep you around to come crawling in whenever you feel like it. And Hiram had heard it all before. I'm sorry, Mr. Tatum. The truck wouldn't start, then I had to get a ride. But the truth is, Mr. Tatum had heard all these excuses before. In fact, twice this week, Tatum shook his head, his scowl deepening. Excuses, always excuses. You think I'm running a charity here? Folks rely on this place, and I can't have you slacking off. Hiram felt that old familiar spark of anger flare up inside him, but he pushed it down. He needed this job, as thankless as it was. I'll make it up to you, Mr. Tatum. I promise. Just give me a chance. The store owner sighed, his anger in his eyes giving way to something that almost looked like pity. You know, Hiram, I've seen men like you come and go, always running from something and always with a bottle in hand. You think I can't smell that? You stink to high heavens, fella. And you need to get your act together or you'll end up just like the rest of them, dead in a ditch or rotten in some jail cell. Hiram's jaw tightened, but he nodded. I understand, sir. I'll do better. Well, see that you do. Tatum's voice softened slightly. Now tighten up and get to work. There's a pile of tires in the back that need changing, and Miss Roberts is coming in for an oil change. I need you to handle it when she comes in, but for God's sake, whatever you do, don't breathe on her. Hiram nodded again and headed towards the back of the station. The day wore on. Lunch came and went as Hiram worked through the task that Tatum had given to him. The sun climbed higher in the sky and the station buzzed with activity as locals came and went, filling their tanks and gossiping about the day's news. And despite the hard work and the lingering hangover, Hiram somehow made it through. Old man Tatum took the open sign off the window and then locked the office door for the day as Hiram pulled the garage door bay down. For his work, Hiram had earned a pack of Marlboros and $20 cash. 
The old man climbed into his truck and rolled his window down. Look here, Hiram. If you're late tomorrow, don't bother coming. You understand what I'm getting at. Hiram lit the cigarette and nodded before setting out, walking down the road. His shack was a mile and a half away, but at least there was a liquor store on the way. But before he got a quarter mile down the road, a shiny Buick pulled over. Need a ride? A voice called out. Hiram looked up, surprised at his sudden good luck. The driver was a woman with dark hair and warm, familiar eyes. She looked at him with a bit of curiosity as he leaned down to open the car door. Yeah, sure, thanks, Hiram replied, opening the passenger door and sliding in. Moments later, the woman pulled back onto the road and they drove in silence for a bit. Hiram glanced over, feeling a strange sense of deja vu. Do I know you, ma'am? He asked, with a question slipping out before he could stop himself. She smiled with a bit of amusement in her eyes. I was just about to ask you the same thing. You look familiar, but I can't quite place it. They lapsed into silence again, each lost in their own thoughts as the drive went on. And before long, the blacktop soon gave way to the narrow gravel road and the rural houses turned into woods that passed by in a blur. The fading light of the sun casting long shadows across the road. Hiram felt a strange, sobering pull, like he was on the edge of remembering something important. And in the distance, Hiram's old international truck was still parked on the side of the road in a patch of tall wildflowers. You can drop me off at that truck. Much obliged for the ride, ma'am, Hiram said. Well, what's wrong with your old truck? The lady asked. No, oh, she's got a wild streak in her, but I've thrown a lot at her. and She just needed a break today. That's all. She'll be back at it tomorrow. The stranger looked over at Hiram and said, Well, that's the thing about wildflowers. No matter what life throws at them, they thrive in the sun and bend gracefully in the wind. Hiram's heart skipped a beat. He turned and looked at her, his eyes wide with shock. His mind drifted back to the little girl who made wildflower necklaces once upon a time. Rose? He whispered. Is that really you? Yes, Hiram. It's me. Hiram froze in stunned silence. The world around him seemed to stop as the long-lost brother and sister looked at each other for the first time in decades. I've been looking for you, Rose said, reaching out to take Hiram's hand. Ever since we were separated, I never stopped hoping we'd find each other again. Hiram squeezed her hand, a tear slipping down his cheek. Ah, I've missed you so much, Rose. I've been lost without you. And there they sat on the side of a dirt road, crying for what seemed like forever, catching up on the years that they had missed. Let's go home, brother. And with that, Rose took Hiram home to Mississippi to start a new life. And for the first time in ages, Hiram knew he could face whatever challenges laid ahead. And from this moment on, no matter what life threw at him, he would find the strength to bend gracefully in the wind like wildflowers. Mm-hmm.